I have indeed written this book, which has just uh, fortuitously been published in Germany by uh, Zurkamp. And um, I, I'd like to thank uh, Ulrika Bischoff, the translator, just to um, give her credit for, uh, I think, a wonderful job that she's done in producing um, the translation into German for my book, which was published about a year ago in the UK called Burning the Books, A History of Knowledge Under Attack. And although the title of my book is very much about attacks on knowledge, its essence is really to try to argue for the social importance of preserving knowledge and the importance of libraries and archives in particular in that role on behalf of society to keep knowledge alive, to pass it from one generation to the next. And really the kind of broadest possible interpretation of um, this conference and for the KEK organization, which we are celebrating its second birthday uh, today. And it's, it's such a pleasure to be doing that with you. Uh, and actually I'm going to begin with a quotation from George Orwell. And I, I guess that novel with its focus on the manipulation of knowledge and the control of knowledge speaks to me very profoundly about the importance of being a librarian, an archivist, and being um, responsible for um, the preservation of knowledge. Because really what we are, what we are colleagues, is we are institutions that cling to the truth. And that's really the, the theme of my, my talk this evening. And um, yes, we would be gathered in the Staatsbibliothek just across Unter den Linden from the, seat, the, the, the location of the events which you see on the screen in front of you, the organized burning of books that took place on the 10th of May, 1933, organized by the Nazi party, organized by Josef Goebbels and uh, intended to erase, destroy knowledge that was deemed to be un-German. And as I came to a meeting in the Staatsbibliothek in 2018, I walked around Babelplatz and I saw the very moving um, uh, memorialization of those events that's there today. And it struck me that this didn't happen that long ago. My own mother was alive when those events happened. She's still alive today, I'm, I'm pleased to say. But I think we need to remember that these, um, these attacks on knowledge have happened through history and they continue to happen today. But attacks on knowledge are not just in the age in which we live, um, very physical acts of destruction. They can also be acts of the manipulation of facts and evidence. And really what libraries and archives are, are repositories of evidence. And we saw that when in 27, uh, 2017, um, uh, just after President Trump's inauguration, his press secretary, Kellyanne Conway, coined the term alternate facts as she tried to defend the um, uh, against the multiplicity of evidence that more people had attended um, President Trump's inauguration, she claimed, than had attended President Obama's inauguration um, in, in 2009. And of course, the evidence pointed in the opposite direction, but she claimed that alternate facts could, um, could, could deny this. But really, my book was triggered by the, um, uh, the, the knowledge that a body of evidence, an archive held by the UK government's home office, the um, government department that had been instigating a very aggressive immigration policy called the hostile environment, to give you a sense of how aggressive that immigration policy has been, 
But in 2018, it became it was revealed that that same government department had destroyed a large archive of evidence that the same individuals who were being challenged by the, the hostile environment to prove their right to remain in, in the UK. And these individuals were mostly immigrants from former British colonies who had been invited to come and work and live in the UK after World War II. Um, and the first of them came on a ship called the Empire Windrush. And, and that term, uh, the Windrush generation, came to uh, define a whole, a whole generation or more of immigrants into the UK. So many of these individuals were being challenged um, from 2010 in the hostile environment, and they could have defended themselves if this archive of evidence had been preserved. But it was destroyed, and this seemed to me to be a classic example of the social importance of preserving knowledge. And I wrote an article in the Financial Times newspaper, which um, uh, ha has led directly to the publication of this book. But actually, since the book has been published, it's impossible not to notice how many uh, arguments there are and have been for the preservation of libraries and archives in an age when they continue to be under attack. Um, uh, and, and archives of all kinds are... Um, are being challenged now in society for um, making their content, making their evidence available to the public, just business archives, for example. Um, but more generally, this is an article about uh, access to information held by the Canadian government. And we've seen in recent months um, underfunding of the National Library of Wales, the National Archives of Australia, and a whole variety of other institutions whose task for society is to preserve knowledge, but they have been uh, challenged either through underfunding or through, through legislation. And I think it is time, I think the time is now for society and for our sector to become much more visible and vocal in seeking in the public sphere to defend libraries and archives and the task that they undertake for society. And one can see this also in the current debate about um, slavery in the wake of the Black Lives Matter um, movement and uh, following the murder of George Floyd in the United States last year. In the UK, we've seen uh, uh, an incredible project led by University College London to um, make available the records of the Slave Compensation Commission, which had been preserved in the National Archives, um, which show that at at the point that slavery was abolished in the British Empire, that actually former slave owners were given massive um, financial compensation for um, uh, releasing slaves. And this, this has uh, the, the uh, availability of this information through the website that the UCL project called Legacies of British Slavery has made available, has been uh, highly influential and highly um, uh, uh, visible in the UK media. There have been TV programmes and many debates about it which have drawn attention to those who continue to benefit from slavery, um, uh, uh, where many of the descendants of slaves um, do not have access to such financial resources. And of course, that project would not be possible if the National Archives of the United Kingdom had not preserved those uh, archives in its collections and indeed made them available um, to those researchers. And if we see this uh, all around the UK, um, uh, particularly as we deal with the legacies of empire, um, most recently with the famous um, case of the migrated archives collection that had been kept secretly by the UK government's Foreign and Commonwealth Office and only revealed when 
uh, a high court case from uh, uh, Kenyan uh, individuals seeking to uh, have access to information about this brutal suppression of the Mau Mau rebellion um, came to the high court and the high court forced that that government department to make this um, secret archive of migrated records um, uh, publicly available. And that, that, that collection has now been passed to the National Archives um, where it should have been um, uh, all along. And, and again, even more recent um, has been, we've seen attacks on libraries and archives in Afghanistan in just the last two or three months. I wrote a, an article about this again for the Financial Times newspaper a few weeks ago, drawing attention to um, the importance that libraries and archives have had in Afghanistan um, in, in recent years since the fall of the first Taliban regime um, um, and uh, the, 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 the way that they had supported citizens, uh, particularly women in Afghan society, but of course, um, in, in, uh, since the middle of August, they've been attacked, many of them have been destroyed, many librarians and archivists have fled outside of Afghanistan, and those libraries are all now empty uh, or closed, um, even in the universities, or perhaps even especially in the universities um, in Kabul. But my book actually takes a very long sweep of history. It goes back to the ancient libraries of the Mesopotamian kingdoms, the first libraries and archives that we know of, um, some of them going back um, um, six or seven um, millennia. Uh, but I look in particular at the case of the library of King Ashurbanipal of Assyria, um, whose uh, library is perhaps, um, scholars argue, the earliest known that attempted to capture the whole of knowledge as it was understood at the time. And this um, was formed in the seventh century before the Christian era. And we know about it because of an extraordinary archeological um, excavation that was undertaken by a, a, a British uh, explorer um, in the middle of the 19th century called Austin Henry Layard. And over 20,000 cuneiform tablets are now in the British Museum. And because scholars have studied these over the last century and a half, we know that many of the texts in Ashurbanipal's library were only there because he attacked libraries in his uh, uh, neighbouring kingdoms, the kingdoms of his enemies, in particular in Babylonia, where he knew of the existence of important texts, and texts in particular that dealt with the prediction of the future, astrology, astronomy, divination. And these texts, he sought to be brought into his own library to make his own knowledge base more powerful and to weaken the knowledge base of his enemies. Um, I also look at the case of the Great Library of Alexandria, um, perhaps the most notable uh, library in the ancient world, and indeed one of uh, the earliest manuscripts in the Bodleian, uh, a, a manuscript from the 9th century of Euclid's Elements of Geometry, which came from Byzantium. This manuscript, this text, was actually written by Euclid in the Great Library of Alexandria, um, uh, and uh, this is the earliest um, witness uh, to that text to have survived. But of course, the Library of Alexandria is famous, or perhaps um, mythically famous, for having been destroyed in a great fire, and there have been various um, allegations that the fire was uh, caused deliberately, um, during the conflict between Ptolemy and Caesar. But in fact, scholars now know that the library uh, did not was not destroyed in one single occasion. There was no great fire, as this 19th century engraving rather um, imaginatively suggests. But in fact, the library um, declined over many centuries so that um, by the fourth century of the Christian era, the library had pretty much ceased to exist and its contents um, having um, been dispersed or decayed, probably through physical degradation rather than through deliberate destruction. And I think um, what 
the, the classical classic classical scholars tell us what they agree on is that there was a great library and the greatest library known to the ancient world but that over a period of six or seven centuries it 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 ceased to be supported and patronized um, by the royal the the royal family in uh, in Egypt, in Alexandria. And this today is a lesson for us about neglect and uh, underfunding. And uh, it's, it's uh, the, as the ancient library of Alexandria ceased to be a library that was supported by the ruling powers, it declined. And that, I fear, is what is happening in many countries today. We need to pay attention to this neglect of libraries and archives uh, in modern society. I'd like to move us on now to another instance of the destruction of knowledge, to um, my own city, to Oxford, where the first library of the university was formed just over 700 years ago in 1320. It was housed in the university church in a building specially built for it with funds provided by the Bishop of Worcester, a man called Thomas Cobham. And this library um, was began to be built, as I said, in 1320. By the middle of the 15th century, the library had grown large enough to require a new building. And that building still exists today. It's known as Duke Humphreys Library because it was built to house the gift of books by Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester, the brother of King Henry V, and one of the most powerful laymen in England. And this library existed until the middle of the 16th century when it was attacked by the Protestant reformers under uh, King Edward VI in 1549 or 1550. And only a handful of books from the four or 500 books that existed in 1549, only a handful of them now survive and only four of them are in Oxford. But this attack on the, uh, the medieval university library had been um, uh, presaged by attacks on many other libraries across um, England during the first phase of the Protestant Reformation under Henry VIII, when uh, the great monastic houses, the monasteries, nunneries, and other religious institutions were suppressed by Henry VIII, and he, the libraries, some of them, uh, some of the contents of which were moved into the Royal Library um, in order to provide evidence for Henry's attempt to divorce himself from Catherine of Aragon and to marry the beautiful courtier Anne Boleyn, and then later to divorce the church in England from papal authority and to establish himself um, as the head of the church in England. And this uh, process of the first reformation in the 1530s uh, resulted in the destruction of hundreds of libraries, um, more than 80% of which were completely destroyed and only uh, a relatively small number of books survive to this day. And some of those books um, ended up being torn up and sold to butter makers to wrap butter in, to pie makers to line pie dishes, and, uh, uh, and to bookbinders to strengthen bookbindings. And a phrase um, uh, in Oxford at the time was that books were dog cheap and whole libraries could be had for an inconsiderable nothing. But actually that act of destruction prompted an act of preservation. And that act was um, made by this man, uh, Sir Thomas Bodley, um, who in 1598, wrote to the Chancellor of Oxford University, um, offering himself with his own wealth and his own energy, his own contacts, to rebuild the university library that had been destroyed during the Reformation. And, and Thomas was a Protestant himself, but he bitterly regretted the acts of destroying books and documents in the earlier generation. And he um, endowed the new institution which opened its doors in November 1602 for the first time and he built the institution both physically, here you can see this 
cupboards, lead lined cupboards that were built to house the great treasures of the library, but also um, uh, intellectually with the founding statutes devoted to the preservation and access to knowledge. One of the documents that came into the library in the first decades after its um, foundation was uh, this document known as Magna Carta, um, a charter of liberties that had been uh, formulated in the year 1215 and designed to limit the power of uh, the monarch um, by uh, uh, agreement with the leading noblemen of the country. And this, 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 this document came into legal force and it was um, issued on many occasions in the 13th century to remind uh, the country that the king had agreed to have his powers limited by uh, the rule of law. And of course, the king who agreed to this, King John, uh, was regarded as being, um, uh, you know, has gone down in history as being one of the great villains of uh, English history. But actually, that document um, has become um, a, an absolutely iconic a document in constitutional history and in the history of democracy um, because of uh, this clause in particular, which states that no freeman could be taken or imprisoned uh, or dispossessed of his property or liberties, um, except through lawful judgment of his peers or through the law of the land. And um, so Magna Carta has become an incredibly talismanic uh, document. But its presence um, has been partly because of those original documents preserved in collections in the United Kingdom. And they were rediscovered um, uh, and by later generations. And uh, that clause in particular came to inform many other um, constitutions, uh, in particular in the New World, in the, um, in the colonies, and then eventually into um, the Declaration of Independence and to the United States Constitution. And that act was partly due to this man, William Blackstone, uh, a jurist, a great legal scholar uh, based in Oxford, who in 1754 wrote a book about Magna Carta, um, which included um, uh, him uh, citing copies of Magna Carta which were in the Bodleian Library just around the corner from his college uh, All Souls where he was uh, able to consult them in the Bodleian and include them in his book and that book um, was read avidly by uh, the architects of the American Constitution like Thomas Jefferson um, who had it in his own private library and of course we now see that clause in the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. Um, or, you know, very, or it could almost be lifted directly from the 13th century document. And indeed, we see that clause in many other uh, constitutional documents around the world. But ironically, um, the British, um, having lost the, Ameri uh, the, the colonies to um, the United States, um, partly through, the, um, through the, uh, their kind of um, uh, clinging to the truth of Magna Carta, um, uh, a, a, a rather more shameful episode took place um, shortly afterwards in 1814, when this man, um, Admiral Sir George Coburn, on behalf of the um, British government led an expeditionary force to uh, the United States. And the scene in the back of this rather uh, 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 exciting mezzotint, the burning of Washington DC took place at his hands. And we can see from this um, uh, watercolor uh, that his forces entered Washington um, in August, 1814 and made directly for the center of government, the Capitol building, um, which was indeed the only stone building in Washington at the time. Washington had only been founded um, in 1800. And they found in the Capitol building, the Library of Congress, a library of a relatively small library, about uh, 5,000 books um, in 1814 that were there to support the 
houses of the uh, gov uh, of the legislature, but also to serve the bureaucrats in the government departments. And so the British forces set fire to the library, which eventually burned down the whole building. And in fact, we have an eyewitness account from a member of the British Expeditionary Force. Um, but again, that destruction prompted an act of renewal, a preservation, this time by Thomas Jefferson, uh, one of the architects of the American Constitution, one of the first presidents who offered uh, who had essentially retired to his country seat at Monticello in Virginia, outside of Washington. Of course, he heard of the events of August uh, 1814 and wrote a scathing letter to a Washington newspaper calling the destruction of the library an act of barbarism by the British. And he offered his own private library to replace the lost library, which indeed um, was uh, an offer that was taken up um, by um, uh, Congress, who voted funds to purchase the library, 7,000 books from, from Jefferson's collection, which uh, restarted the Library of Congress, um, which, of course, as we heard uh, earlier this afternoon, um, is uh, indeed an institution still to this day that takes uh, preservation very seriously indeed. Uh, I'd like to move us forward in time to the Holocaust of World War II and to the events that followed the, that burning of books in 1933, um, which uh, scholars have argued um, is one of the most um, devastating periods for the survival of knowledge in human history. It's been argued that over 100 million books were destroyed during the Holocaust of um, the middle of the 20th century. Uh, I'd like to take us back to Lithuania, to the town of Vilna or Vilnius as it is known, where, um, uh, which was a large center of Jewish population um, uh, by the middle of the 20th century, uh, uh, a very vibrant center of Jewish civilization, Jewish religion. It was uh, uh, a city famous for its learned rabbis like the Vilna Gaon, and also a city famous for its Jewish libraries and archives. Here is the Strashun Library, uh, a library formed by a wealthy Jewish businessman and bequeathed by him at the end of the 19th century to the Jewish community. And it had a vibrant reading room and a learned librarian, Cheikh Lundsky, uh, on the eve of World War II. But it also had a famous archival institution known as YIVO, an institution dedicated to uh, preserving the documents of everyday Jewish life, particularly the life under kind of transacted in the Yiddish language. But it was also an educational institution uh, as well, using its collections to educate um, the, the, the Jewish community um, in Lithuania. And it collected documents of everyday Jewish life, um, theater posters, music hall scores. Um, on the right-hand side of your screen, um, medical case notes. On the left-hand side of your screen, the diary of Theodore Herzl, one of the founders of Zionism. But you know, of course, in 1941, um, the Operation Barbarossa unleashed the Nazi uh, war machine on the countries of Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and it also unleashed um, a, uh, an organization whose purpose was to um, attack libraries and archives and to seize documents and books for uh, 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 an institute established by the person on the left-hand side of your screen, uh, Alfred Rosenberg, who established an institute for the study of the Jewish question, a kind of perverted research institute in Frankfurt. And he established an operational group led by the man on the right-hand side of your screen, Johannes Poole, who at one point had been a librarian in the State Library of Berlin, who's led a team that came in the wake of the stormtroopers to target libraries and archives for either for destruction or for Rosenberg's Frankfurt Institute. They got to uh, Vilna uh, in, um, in 1941, they established a ghetto and the ghetto, um, the Jews were moved into the ghetto 
And in the ghetto, librarians and archivists were targeted by Paul's team, and they were forced at gunpoint to come out of the ghetto every day to sort through the many books and documents in the many libraries and archives of the city. And that task, of course, for them was a terrible one. They had to choose books that either would be saved and moved away from Vilna to Frankfurt or to be sent to the paper mills for destruction. And they became known as the Paper Brigade by the Nazi guards. They soon called themselves that. But actually what they did was to every day risk their lives by smuggling books and documents back into the ghetto um, in the evening after their day of sorting. They hid them in their clothes, they hid them in furniture, they persuaded the Nazi guards that they needed the, the paper in order to light the fires in the ghetto, but they managed to take books and documents back and hide them in the ghetto in the hope that some of them would survive and be able to recover them after the war. But this, the, this kind of behaviour, this determination to preserve the records of their communities, the records of their society, was also happening simultaneously in other cities in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, this extraordinary man, uh, uh, Emmanuel Ringelblum, um, had a group in Warsaw which documented the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, they hid books and documents in, uh, in the ghetto, which of course was raised, um, was liquidated at the end of 1943, um, and, um, uh, but, their trove of documents that they had preserved, even though they were all murdered, were hidden in the rubble of the ghetto and found after uh, the end of World War II in metal canisters, which um, are still uh, now available for study in Poland today. Uh, Rosenberg's uh, Research Institute in Frankfurt was uh, 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 overtaken by American troops in 1945, and here you can see an American forces rabbi um, with those uh, documents in Frankfurt, and they were moved into a great warehouse where um, American troops tried to relocate those um, documents uh, in Frankfurt to the heirs of their rightful owners. And in fact, the YIVO Institute had established a branch in New York. And here in 1947, you see um, staff of uh, YIVO in New York receiving documents that had been recovered um, in Frankfurt. But actually, uh, uh, an extraordinary thing then happened for the documents that had stayed in in Vilna had been hidden in the, the Vilna ghetto. Um, although most of the members of the ghetto were murdered when it was liquidated in 1943, some escaped and some joined, though they joined partisans in the forest who pushed um, the, um, uh, the, the Nazi army out and uh, the Soviet uh, regime then took uh, power in Vilna and uh, yet again, those documents were targeted for attack um, by the Soviet regime and sent once more to the paper mills for destruction. But this time, a Lithuanian librarian, Antonas Ulpis, who you see on your screen, was responsible for turning the trucks around and hiding them in an outpost of the National Library of Lithuania that he was responsible for, hiding them even in the organ pipes of the church and risking his own life and keeping them a secret until after the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, when it was safe to reveal their presence, where they were uh, now being digitized in a collaboration between the National Library of Lithuania and the Yibo Institute in New York. But of course, the, um, the cultural genocide of the Holocaust was followed by the human genocide. And sadly, we saw that again in the wars that followed the breakup of the former Yugoslavia in the 1990s. And again, this was not long ago, colleagues. This was in living memory. My brother served in the UN uh, forces in Kosovo. But in August 1992, Serb militia fired incendiary 
shells at the National Library of Bosnia and Herzegovina in Sarajevo. No other buildings were targeted on that day. It was a deliberate attempt to erase the multicultural contents of the National Library of Sarajevo. Um, Serb snipers targeted um, uh, librarians and firefighters who tried to rescue collections from the burning building, uh, and indeed one of them was murdered on that day. Um, but this, it was not just the National Library that was targeted. Libraries and archives across Bosnia and Kosovo were attacked, and uh, particular land registries, archives, uh, uh, recording property ownership by Muslims were destroyed, an attempt to eradicate any record of land ownership um, by Muslims uh, at this time. And there was a, a librarian, Andros Riedelmeyer, who led a project to try to recover um, the lost library of the Oriental Institute in Sarajevo um, by seeking microfilm copies that had come into other libraries, digitizing them and presenting the digital files back uh, to the Oriental Institute. But he was also employed by UNESCO to survey all of the libraries and archives in Bosnia and in Kosovo, which were then um, presented as evidence at the raw crime tribunal for the former Yugoslavia at The Hague uh, following the re revisions to The Hague Convention. Um, and um, he gave evidence eyeball to eyeball in the trials of Slobodan Milosevic and Rakan Mladic. And you can see his testimony online um, and it's very powerful indeed on the attacks on libraries and archives. Uh, and indeed, earlier this year, uh, the Turkish writer Elif Shafak um, uh, drew um, the murder of Ada Butarovic by Serb snipers uh, again uh, to, to our memory. And we must not forget, um, particularly at, at a time when ethnic um, tensions are high once again in the region, that um, the, the preservation of knowledge is a key element for um, uh, an open pluralistic society. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about our current regime of digital knowledge in the world, which I deal um, up, on in the book. And of course, we're in an age where, as my colleague in Oxford, Timothy Garton Ash calls it, um, our the public knowledge is controlled by private superpowers. I like that phrase of his very much. Private superpowers, the big tech companies control so much of public knowledge when we are placing so much uh, uh, of our, our, our own knowledge in the form of images or email or documents on social media platforms or on other storage platforms which are, are ostensibly free but of course we are paying for that uh, uh, for that storage in many other ways and of course the web is a very fragile medium and its fragility um, puts um, democratic societies at risk, I argue in the book. For example, um, the opinions of the Supreme Court of the United States, uh, a Harvard Law Library study found in 2011 that that website, 40% um, of the web links on that website were broken and led nowhere. And you know, it seems to me that it's absolutely essential for an open society that the laws of the land are available to all its citizens. And of course, we saw that again in earlier this year, where an insurgent mob um, entered the, um, the Capitol building. I think uh, five people were killed on that day. And uh, it's clear now that they used encrypted messaging services to communicate, to organize themselves, to storm the Capitol building. Um, but um, the Internet Archive um, uh, a not-for-profit library organization in San Francisco archived the Parler website, the app that they were all using. And of course, we've seen through the revelations in recent months uh, of uh, how Facebook was using um, the data created by many individuals, by millions of individuals, to manipulate elections or to influence uh, elections from 2016 onwards, um, uh, targeting political advertising um, 
uh, in ways that were paid for and manipulated by uh, political organizations. And of course, there is no archive, there is no Facebook archive. Um, so we do not have a record of those uh, political adverts. And this is something which is of increasing concern uh, to me and where I think libraries and archives should be paying greater um, uh, 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 greater attention in terms of the preservation of knowledge. And we can see that some libraries and archives are doing good work in this area. The National Library of New Zealand, for example, has a project to ask New Zealanders to donate their Facebook archive. And we can see how important this is if you look, uh, I don't know how many of you watching wear Fitbits or use iWatches to um, monitor your personal health uh, data, your biometric data. But of course, we've now seen that Google have purchased Fitbit and they are able um, to monitor your future health. It kind of takes us back to the ancient library of Ashurbanipal, where he was concerned about the prediction of the future. Well, of course, uh, the big tech companies, the private superpowers are also interested in predicting your future behavior because it helps them sell commercial advertising. And we also have seen in recent uh, years how powerful social media has been in uh, Donald Trump's political success, for example, but also that he deleted or his staff deleted many of his messages soon after uh, they were posted. And we've also seen in, in the United Kingdom the use of encrypted messaging services like Signal between politicians, civil servants and special advisors in order to evade freedom of information and other legislation designed uh, to provide transparency on the formulation of government policy. And again, I've written um, uh, in recent months uh, opinion pieces in the Financial Times and Times newspapers about the danger of allowing these um, uh, communication systems to be used by our paid uh, politicians and, uh, and other officials in order to evade public scrutiny. And again, it calls to mind Orwell with his um, incredibly prescient novel 1984. The past was erased, the erasure was forgotten, the lie became truth. And I'd like to bring you back to that notion that libraries and archives and their role in preserving knowledge are institutions that help society cling to the truth. I know. Of course, as we've learned this afternoon at the conference, and I'm sure we will further tomorrow, um, we've seen the challenges that libraries and archives face, both um, in terms of the techniques of preservation and conservation, uh, in the strategies and organizing themselves, but also in terms of funding. Um, the preservation of the analog past is uh, a, a huge challenge for us all, but one in which we are um, in libraries and archives around the world very much aware of and trying our best to develop strategies to address it. But of course, the challenges of digital preservation are an additional technological and financial burden on libraries and archives. One way of tackling this, I suggest, is by a memory tax on the profits of the big tech companies, on the profits of the private superpowers that should go back to the library and archive sector to help us deal with the social um, good that is preserved knowledge, one of the pillars, I argue, of an open society. And I'd like to just remind you of some of the, um, uh, the roles that libraries and archives play for society, just uh, in conclusion. Of course, they are uh, educational institutions helping um, to provide, um, if you like, self-service knowledge to all of our citizens, no matter what background they come from, no matter what wealth uh, they have, uh, they're all treated equally um, in libraries and archives. And again, that right to education you see taking us back to the UN Declaration on Human Rights is an absolutely fundamental, uh, fundamental right and one which libraries and archives really strongly help to deliver. Libraries and archives are institutions that 
provide for a diversity of knowledge. They help bring knowledge that can challenge received opinion. They can also bring a diversity of ideas from around the globe, indeed a diversity of language, which helps our society, particularly in an increasingly globalized world that we live in, it can help bring that diversity to bear uh, on our society, on our communities. And that sense of um, human beings having uh, e equal rights in terms of dignity um, uh, is one which we also see in another uh, um, uh, role that libraries and archives fulfill for society, and that is one of preserving rights themselves. And here we see uh, the Stasi archive. And I think I argue in the book that the, uh, the Gauk authority that was established to provide access, the right of access to citizens' files from the former Stasi so that they could see um, who had been informing on them um, is a sign of a healthy uh, of a healthy and open society. Everyone has the right of freedom of thought, says the, um, the, the UN Declaration on Human Rights. And of course, libraries and archives, and I uh, I've already told you about Magna Carta, are reference points for facts and truth in an age of disinformation, in an age when um, uh, those truths and those facts are being um, uh, ignored or cancelled all, all the time. And finally, libraries and archives are places where the identity of communities, the identity of societies can be preserved and made available to those communities uh, in order to enrich their lives and to give their identity um, further, further strength and power. So I'd like to thank you for listening. Um, I um, would like to thank the organisers of the conference once again for including me, but also for uh, putting on such a rich and powerful display of speakers from uh, around uh, around the world, indeed, not just from across Europe, um, on this absolutely vital subject and one in which libraries and archives must collaborate and uh, work together to solve these problems for society itself.